Welcome to Mount Elim's YouTube service. It is good to see you, and we hope and pray that this will be a blessing to you. If you'd like to come to Mount Elim, we meet twice in the church building on Sunday at 10.30 and 6 o'clock. You'll be given a warm welcome. We also have a Zoom live stream of the evening service at 6 o'clock. If you'd like more details, then do send an email to me at steph.jones1980 at gmail.com. Subscribe to this channel for the latest information. Every blessing to you. Now let us sing our first hymn together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There are precious Hi everyone, it's good to see you today. Hope that you're well and that you've had a good week. We hope and pray that this video will be a blessing to you. Paul Whiteley is the pastor of Emmanuel Church in Gabalva in Cardiff and we're grateful that he's able to join us at Mount Elim today. I'm down in Pembrokeshire, preaching in Penwell Church in Roach near Haverford West. There is a communion service at Mount Elim and so Paul will be preaching on communion. And very helpfully, he sent us a recording 
of a, a sermon that he preached on the subject in Emmanuel. Let us listen to God's word. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to, obey, uh, to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. You know, it's common in every aspect of life to get over familiar with things that we do repetitively. It's so easy, isn't it, to lose the sense and the meaning and the wonder of things that we do again and again and again. It slowly drifts. We're going to have this all night, aren't we? I'll just carry on. If you can't hear me, I apologize. Um, but it, we slowly drift into apathy once we do things again and again. And that's certainly true, I think, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, um, or as we sometimes call it, communion. It's so easy as we bow to pray over the bread and of the wine and we bow our head, we close our eyes and our minds can so easily drift to, what have I got coming up in this week? Um, <clears throat> I wonder how long this prayer will be. Uh, I did enjoy that meal I had this afternoon. And our mind just drifts and we've become so used to taking communion, we've lost perhaps the wonder the meaning, the purpose of what, why are we taking a tiny piece of bread and drinking a tiny bit of juice? It's almost too easy to take it robotically without thought put into it. What am I doing in this moment as I eat this bread? What is going on in my mind as I drink this juice? Some, you know, some churches celebrate communion 12 times a year. Our church here in Emmanuel we celebrate 24 times a year, twice a month. Church I grew up in, 52 times a year, every week. And the scripture doesn't say how often, but it does say we should take it often. But when we take it often, however often that is, we mustn't do it unthinkingly. But as often as we take it, we must do it in active and deliberate remembrance of Christ. Remember the dying thief on the cross as he looks to Jesus, he says, remember me, Lord, when you come 
into your kingdom. Well, in here in communion, Jesus is saying, remember me often because you're in my kingdom. And so we do. But in order to do it well, it's good to be reminded regularly of what we're doing, why we're doing, how glorious it is, how beautiful it is to find in these few moments, set aside in church life, who is Christ? What has he done? What does he mean to me in my life at this moment? So what is communion all about? Well, firstly, it's a meal hosted by Christ. You know, if we went back to the beginning of time, there in the Garden of Eden, we would find the triune God walking in community with the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. They were in communion with their creator. And in that original garden, they walked with the Lord and they, they feasted at this global table of sumptuous fruit. He said, anything you want to eat, enjoy, because we're in communion together. Feast with me. This promise was that as long as they ate his food at the table he had provided, they would enjoy communion with him without delay, without, uh, without an end. But he says there's one simple table in this universe that you must not feast at. It's that tree in the center of the garden. If you feast on that, at that table, you are breaking off communion with me. You're breaking off fellowship with the good and gracious God, and you are uniting yourself to the evil one. You're eating at the wrong table. Well, as we know, if we know our Bibles at all, the rest is history. With all the sumptuous global feasts they have, they turn to this one tree and say, I feast at this table over and above the table of the Lord. They quickly run to the forbidden table. And that's been the history of our world since that moment. God has consistently invited us Return, return to the table of the Lord. Come and enjoy communion with me. Come and feast at my table. As Isaiah said, God offers us wine and milk without money, without price. We freely can come into relationship, communion with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. But the theme of history has been this constant tug towards the forbidden meal. Even for us as God's people, it's that constant temptation. There's that tree. There's that table. Let's go feast there. Let's forget the table of the Lord. Remember how God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. Brings them out. Leads them forward to the promised land. This land, he says, is going to be flowing with milk and honey. And we'll spend time together. We'll be there forever together. Come and I'll provide for you along the way. He sends manna down from heaven because he's saying that the promised land is coming, but until that day, I'll fellowship with you in the desert and we'll eat together from the manna from heaven. Here's how Psalm 78 described that time. God gave a command to the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained manna for them to eat. He gave them grain from heaven. People ate the bread of angels. He sent them an abundant supply of food. It's a wonderful descriptive language of this communion in the desert as he led them to the final communion in the promised land. But then what happens? The journey is taking too long. So they begin to long for the foods of Egypt, the foods of slavery, the forbidden food. Numbers 11 graphically describes how the Israelites wept again and said, who will feed us meat? We remember the free fish we ate in Egypt, along with the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing to look at but this manna. They had forgotten that in rescuing them from Egypt, God was promising them eternal joy in the land of promise, the land of feasting. And they'd forgotten that Passover feast that God instituted in the day that they left Egypt. But God says, I want you to feast with me. I want you to eat with me 
every year the, to remember the time death passed over you and you left Egypt and came out to live in fellowship with me forever. They'd forgotten all that. They'd forgotten the Passover celebration. Now they were longing again for the food of slavery and death. As sumptuous as a cucumber might be, and I don't like cucumbers, but if they wanted cucumbers, yeah, but they were longing not for cucumbers really, but to feast at the wrong table like Adam and Eve. I don't know if you've ever taken a bite of a fruit and there's been a worm in it, or you've opened a salad and there's been a dead fly in it. It looks okay on the outside. It looks sumptuous on the outside. Well, because of sin, it's deep within every human heart to desire what looks good from this world. It looks sumptuous. I'm going to feast at the table of the world. But it's the food of slavery. And inside, as we open up the food of the world and feast upon it, it's filled with death. It's filled with communion with the evil one, not with the Lord Jesus. This was Adam and Eve. This was the Israelites. This was the world. And so often it's us feasting at the table of the world instead of the table of Christ. And so God tonight, he invites us to a better table. The place where we will be eternally brought into communion with him. We will fellowship with him forever. Jesus described this in John 6. When we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, we are taking part in, we're, we're feasting upon eternal bread that satisfies. We're drinking from him the true and final manna from heaven because he's the bread of life. As we trust him, we receive eternal communion with God. We receive eternal life, and death will never pass over us again. It's little wonder, then, that Jesus institutes this very small feast on the day of Passover to remind us both of the past, how God rescues his people from slavery, brings them to the promised land, but to remember particularly what Christ did. As Christ rescued us from the slavery of our sin so that we could delight in him and feast on him and walk through the desert of this world until we reach the final promised land to be with him forever. It's the feast we read earlier in Luke 22, where on the night of betrayal, he gathers his disciples into this upper room and he gives them bread and wine to drink. And he says this, he says, this is my body. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so as we take communion, we are sitting at the table of the Lord once more. Tonight, this is a feast hosted by the King of Kings. In it, as we take it, we are proclaiming Lord, we'd rather be nowhere else. We don't want to feast at the table of the world. We desire Christ. We trust him. We love to sit at your table, Lord, both now and forever. With all that the world is offering us, with all that the evil one says to us right now in our minds, would be a better use of our time than being here. Our eating and drinking, the bread and the wine, are proclaiming once more to the evil one, no thanks. I want to feast at your table. I want to feast at the table of the Lord, the one who bled and died to buy my pardon. I'm happy to be with him. And the more we take communion, the more we are saying no to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, no to the, to the foods of Egypt, and yes to the, to the promised land, yes to the Lamb of God, yes, to the Lord Jesus Christ who died upon that cross. We're saying no to slavery and yes to union with him. This is why 1 Corinthians 10, 21 puts this so graphically. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot share in the Lord's table and the table of demons. 
when we take communion, we're saying, I don't want, I don't want a demonic meal. I want to share the meal with my host, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a meal hosted by Jesus. And that leads us, secondly, to see that this time of communion is a time of renewal of relationship with him. As we take these elements, we are renewing our relationship with the Lord Jesus. You see, as Jesus holds up the cup, what does he say? He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We know what a covenant is from things like marriage ceremonies where bride and groom look at each other and they vow to be faithful and loyal to each other in love for as both as long as they both shall live. Well, this is what God was bringing us into because of the people of God's constant and deliberate breaking of his old covenant with them. The Lord says in the Old Testament, I'm going to make a new covenant that's unbreakable because it doesn't depend upon your faithfulness. It depends upon the cross. It depends upon the lamb who will be slain for you. So I'm going to bring you into a new covenant relationship. And through Jesus, our host, we enter in to this new, impossible to break, communion, relationship with God. And God gives us two signs, two outward, external, physical signs to remind ourselves of this covenant. You know, in marriage, we have this, don't we? We have a ring on our finger. Uh, we put a marriage ring on. Uh, just because we've got a marriage ring on, it doesn't mean that we are married. That, but it's an external symbol that we are. Or sometimes older couples say, Paul, can you um, renew my vows for me? Let's have a celebration, 50 years of marriage or whatever it is. Uh, let's remind ourselves of the vows we made. It's an external symbol of something that happened many, many years ago. And so... Scripture gives us two external symbols that we belong in this covenant relationship with God. The first is baptism. So we go under the water and as we come back out, it's an external symbol. I, by faith, have left my old way of life. I'm no longer joined to sin and to the evil one and to the world and the flesh and the devil. I'm now joined to Christ. I'm alive to him. And we can always look back, can't we, at our baptism and say, I proclaim that Jesus is my Lord. It's like the wedding ring on the finger. I think communion is more like the renewal of the vows. As we gather in as a church every fortnight, we're saying, it's my relationship with Christ. It all depends upon the body and blood of Christ. It's an unbreakable relationship because it's not about what I've done over the last fortnight or over the last year or since I got baptized. It's all about he's died. He shed his blood. He gave his life. He rose again. I believe this. I trust him. I renew my vows again to rest alone upon the finished work of Jesus. And so twice a month in this church, we eat bread and wine to publicly proclaim our covenant sealed by Christ's death. But you know, we don't do this in a solitary way. This is not just me and Jesus in union. We do this as a church because we see thirdly that communion is an expression of the church's union in Christ. We don't sit at home and take communion with our families or we're on holidays. We don't take communion as a family. I don't go as a pastor and administer communion in individuals' houses. We come together as a church to take it. We didn't take it over lockdown, over Zoom, because it's a coming together in person meal. This is what 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. The symbol is broken if we do it any other way than how we do it tonight.
The symbol of communion is that we all eat and drink of one source, one loaf divided among us, one juice shared among these cups for us. All shared equally because we are one body with one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one relationship together as a church we are declaring we unitedly trust the Savior. We as a church rest upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just me and Jesus, it's us and him. This is why the Apostle Paul rebuked the Corinthian church so strongly for the way that they were behaving in such a divisive manner in 1 Corinthians 11. Isn't it ironic that the best teaching we have in the New Testament of what communion is comes in the context of the Apostle Paul rebuking a church for divisiveness? But it's not ironic in the sense that that's, that's the, our unity is found here. The unity is found in communion. He says to them in 1 Corinthians 11, Now in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. You see divisiveness in the church, church splits, church divisions, flow from forgetting who we all are in Christ. At the foot of the cross, we are all humbled by our own sin and need. There at the foot of the cross, we recognize that no Christian is better than another. No Christian is more, self, more righteous because of themselves than another. We are all desperately sinful in need of grace. The same grace responding to the same sin. Here in communion, we are equalized. If there's any pride, we are humbled as we say, ah, oh, I need the body of Christ. I need the blood of Christ. So our regular communion is it's a real reminder, a meal that expresses our unity together in Christ and with Christ. Here, rich and poor take the same bread. Here, the talented and go-getters, they drink the same wine as the forgotten and the low in confidence. It's a meal that proclaims unity. But there is a solitary element to it as well. Because what we see fourthly is that this is a time for self-examination. What a warning there is to be careful in our personal approach to this table. If, you're, if you've got your Bibles open, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 30, we read it all the time at communion. It says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And then this warning. This is why many are sick and fallen asleep among you. It's not saying that we have to have reached some kind of sinless perfection before we can come to the Lord's table and take communion, because who then would ever be able to come? But there is this vital necessity that we come to this place serious, serious about fighting our own sin. Not playing fast and loose with the guidance of God, oh, I'll just take communion and then I'll think about my sin later on, but spending time before we come to say, I hate my sin hate the way that I've spoken and thought and acted in a way that is against the cross, against the gospel. So how do we examine ourselves this evening as we come to this table? Well, firstly, we must ask ourselves, am I a saved person? Am I relying solely on the body and blood of Jesus to make me right with the living God? Is my righteousness a gift received from Christ? Am I a Christian? Am I a saved person? 
Then we ask ourselves, am I a baptized person? Have I taken that first walk with God, that first external covenant sign of relationship with him? And thirdly, we ask ourselves, do I belong to? Am I in good standing with the local church? Because this is a shared participation in one loaf with one people. And so it's vital that I'm no low, lone ranger cowboy attempting to live life on my own and I can do it my way. No, we join ourselves to a body of people so that we fight sin together. We remind each other of the cross. We take communion together from one loaf to say, we are united in this fight, in this trust. You know, when someone has lived unrepentantly and refused to acknowledge their sin, the Bible says that they must be um, removed from the fellowship. They, the old word excommunicated, put out of communion, because they've lived in such a way as to say, I deny the cross. I love the table of the world more than the table of the Lord, and I will not give way I will not repent of my sin and fall before the cross again. They're living in such a way as to demean the gospel and are refusing to come back to the cross for forgiveness. And so they're excluded. They're, they're no longer in good standing in the church, in the body, for the one loaf to be taken. But while we might not have been excommunicated, it is imperative tonight that we that we examine our walk with God. And the big question for us tonight is, am I living repentantly? I'm not perfect, but I'm repentant. Am I truly seeking to live faithfully to his word? We can become over introspective about this and it can become really unhealthy. But surely at the time of communion, this is the time to ask ourselves again, to examine ourselves and to say, am I relying on the cross or am I relying on myself? Do I enjoy the righteousness of Jesus or am I self-righteous? Am I repentant and coming to the cross again and again? And then fifthly, this is a looking forward to heaven. Here is a feast that will last from now until the end of time. And then when Jesus returns, it will stop in its current form, never to be done again in, its, in this way. Scripture tells us that we do this until he comes. We do it until Jesus returns, that second time to wrap up history and take his people home to the final promised land it is until he come but why does it stop then because it's a reminder not only of the past and of the salvation that christ bought at the cross this time is a pointer forward to that moment when we will sit at the final feast of communion what revelation 19 calls the marriage supper of the lamb what a wonderful description we have there in, in Revelation 19 of the, all of the church gathered in from all of history and all the corners of the world, all praising the name of the Lord and sitting together at this huge table. And we're feasting together, celebration of the salvation of our God. We will feast forever at the table of the Lord. There will be no table of the demons, no uh, forbidden tree there. So if you remember your, your mum baking a cake, I, one of the great benefits of having a mum who baked chocolate cake a lot was that she'd put the cake in the oven and then she'd come into the living room. Paul, a big spoon, remember those big spoons? It's covered in warm melted chocolate. I <laughs> had good memories, you can tell. But um, she'd come in, do you want to lick this? Yeah, of course I want to lick this. You lick the warm chocolate. Well, someone has described this communion like that. They say it's a lick of the spoon that whets our appetites for the feast of final fulfillment of all of God's promises. Yes, it's small. 
Yes, this is all insignificant. And it's supposed to be because it's saying, you just wait till you get there. This lick of the spoon. Because one day we'll sit together in a great marriage supper. And so as we take communion today, we look back at the cross and we look forward to then, that final celebration. And so lastly, sixthly, this communion is a proclamation to the world. A proclamation to the world. Scripture says, here we show the Lord's death until he comes. As we lift the bread and the wine to our lips this evening, we are preaching a gospel message to our children. We are preaching a gospel message to any among us who do not know Christ as Savior. We are proclaiming, I feast at the table of the Lord, not at the table of demons. I trust in the bread of life. I'm satisfied in Christ alone. This world has lost its hold. Sin, it's lost its attractiveness. I am united to the one I love. He alone is worthy. Will you come and trust him with me too? You know, we may not be a public preacher or we might not be able to preach in the open air or door knock, and, but we can all eat bread and drink wine and preach a glorious gospel message tonight, telling everyone around us, the table of the world, empty, unfulfilling. Christ is everything. Come and fall at the foot of the cross yourself. If you aren't a Christian tonight, don't take communion. Instead, look around you at the tens of gospel messages being preached to you of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved you gave himself for you. And in that moment, as you look around and see others taking communion, say, Jesus, I want to know what they know. I want to receive what they've received. I want my own salvation. I want to be rescued, redeemed, ransomed, restored, forgiven. I want to feast in the presence of the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want to know Christ. I want, I want sins gone. I want to feast with the Lord Jesus. Here is a table hosted by the Savior, so we remember him. Here we renew our covenant relationship with him, together in unity with each other. We come, examining our own walk with God afresh, relying on his grace, looking forward to glory, and proclaiming the gospel to those around us. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So we share. So we share. Bread of life, and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the king. The body of our Savior Jesus Christ, torn for you.
faithfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of 